the cool products and merchandise that we love, including some that will be announced exclusively at this panel um, on the market for us. Thank you, Sarah. To her left, Eisner Award nominated and should have won. Uh, <laughs> painter, multimedia artist, comics legend, also barbarian, uh, <laughs> Liam Sharp. We have head of Conan Properties, who is in charge of getting all of this stuff again out to the market in the coolest possible form, Fred Momberg. And last but certainly not least, the urban barbarian himself, Dan Panosian, who has been doing his own legendary run on Conan. Uh, um, and Uh, very Frazetta-oriented artists and, and uh, two uh, very Conan-oriented and Frazetta-oriented people to talk about this with. Um, I'm just going to give a quick, like, quick rundown of because uh, we probably all know this stuff chapter and verse. But just to uh, just to recap, um, Conan was the uh, idea of this guy, Robert E. Howard, who was a um, great writer, kind of strange guy, um, who wrote for pulp magazines in the 20s and 30s. And this guy wrote everything. He wrote sports stories, and adventure stories, and action stories, and boxing, and pirates, and whatever they put in the pulps. Westerns, yeah, a lot. And um, whatever he wrote, his, his writing style was so tight and crackling, you couldn't help but turn the pages. Like, this guy could really light up the page the way few people could. And uh, sometime in the... In, 1929, something like that, that um, uh, he came up with the character called Conan the Barbarian, um, very much in his in his concept of sort of in this mythical prehistoric um, age of, of manly men and dashing dames and all of that stuff, um, sword and sorcery, a uh, genre that he practically invented. And he wrote this stuff for a magazine called Weird Tales, which carried a lot of these sort of horror, fantasy, adventure. Um, you can say that it almost invented the genre, um, at least for American audiences for this stuff. So Howard's stuff was being printed in these magazines, and every time a Conan story came out, these issues would fly off the racks. People loved this guy. Um, but the thing is that the pulps were a little bit before comics, and they had nice images on the covers, and they had illustrators that would do these spot illustrations, but the, the visual representation of the concept was never job one. Um, it was about what was on the page there. So we read about Conan, and we would see these illustrated versions of Conan on the page, but it was the words that caught our imaginations and not necessarily the pictures. Um, once the pulps went away, and then the fans of Weird Tales tried to keep a lot of this stuff alive, and so they started publishing uh, the work of Howard and H.P. Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith and some of the other guys that were, that were popular in Weird Tales in these sort of limited edition books in the 1950s. So we have Gnome Press, uh, that's the, so that sort of yellow cover there. That's the cover for Conan the Barbarian. Um, nobody's gonna read that book because of that cover, sorry to say, whoever, whoever did that. Um, you're buying that book because you remember Conan from Weird Tales and it's like, here's a book of Conan. But, along comes this guy. Handsome devil. Handsome devil. And all of a sudden, you don't care what's inside the book because if this guy did the cover, you're buying that book. And so it introduced an entire new audience in the 1960s to not only Conan, but to a whole bunch of other characters. We're going to be talking about Conan here. Um, but uh, Sarah, why don't, you, uh, why don't you give us a little bit of a rundown about Frank? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I want to start more because you guys, you know the history about Frank. I've talked a lot about Frank. I want to just be very specific to Conan um, for this panel. So in the early 60s, my grandfather's career really started taking off. He worked in uh, for Al Cap uh, with Little Abner all through the 50s. So he was a ghost artist. He wasn't really well known. Um, and then his dear friend Roy Frankel helped him get some jobs with Ace for Edgar Rice Burroughs reprints. He started getting um, a lot of movie posters. 
So in the industry, he was, he was known, but he wasn't famous yet. It wasn't until he started working with Lancer and created the iconic image of Conan where his, his fame took off. Now, for, to, to get this job, he actually did some covers with Lancer before Conan. He did The Secret People and Phoenix Prime. So Larry Shaw was the editor at the time at Lancer, and he was like, who am I gonna get to make this book just fly off the shelves? And he saw these two covers, and he was like, Frank Frazetta. So he called my grandpa in the office, and he goes, I wanna, I wanna hire you. And the direction he gave him was James Bama, Doc Savage. He said, this is, this is what I want you to kind of channel when you're thinking of Conan. So my grandpa was like, I can do this, he loved challenges. Um, so he went home and you know did some rough works as he did. And he, of course, in typical Frazetta fashion, he waited till like the last day of the deadline and brought it to Larry Shaw. I think Larry Shaw was like having a little bit of like, he was like, about to have a stroke. He's like, where's, where's the cover, Frank? Oh my God. Um, you know, they were just, they, the publishing at that time, it wasn't like thriving. Um, so yeah, everything was on the line for these Conan, <laughs> paperbacks to fly off the shelves. So they, he comes in the office, and you want to go to the next slide. He brings in Conan the Adventurer, see him on the left there, and as my grandma told it, they were popping champagne, they were celebrating. My dear friend Arnie Fenner said that probably wasn't true, but my grandpa was <laughs> the best storyteller, so he would embellish stories a little bit to make them more interesting, just like his paintings. Um, now, the fun part of this is you'll notice that these paintings are slightly different. The one on the right is probably the one that you recognize the most, that's like the iconic pose and the girl. Um, and and the, the funny story about this is, so my, so my grandpa was, as I mentioned before, he was really working with Roy Crankle and, and you know all through the 50s, he was working with Al Williamson, uh, Wally Wood, Nick Meglin, they were all working together. Um, so he never really went off on his own entirely until this piece. And after it was already published, he invited Roy Crankle over, and Roy Crankle was like, oh, Frank, this is amazing. He's like, oh my God, it's iconic. He goes, but you know, he doesn't have a neck. And Roy, because he was so close to my grandpa, took his knife out, took some turpentine, scraped Conan's head off, and said, paint a neck. <laughs> and my grandpa knew like, you know, just the goat, like he knew anatomy, he studied it. Uh, my grandpa was more just winging it because he was a, you know, he was rather, he'd rather be like playing sports or taking pictures or be with women. Um, so, so he didn't dedicate too much time to becoming like a master of anatomy. Um, so Roy, Roy recounted the story. He said my grandpa actually painted, repainted the neck and the head in two hours. He um, also told him to kind of repaint the girl as well. He was like, you know, just make her a little more, how did Roy say it? Roy said, Frazetta yummy. So he did that and, and it changed history, right? Like this changed the course of everything. So I, I do like to give Roy Crankle his flowers because he was the most humble man and really never got recognition. And if we didn't have Roy Crankle, I don't think we would have had the version of Frazetta we all know and love. So, Book sold pretty well. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Millions. <laughs> and what are we looking at here? This looks like Frank in his studio. That's, yep, that's him with uh, Conan the Usurper, and there's Roy Crankle to the left. We love you, Roy. So prior to coming to this material, was he <laughs> familiar with Conan? Or, I mean, he kind of liked barbarians. He had done a lot of his own. Yeah, he, he loved barbarians. Um, he was not a reader, so again, Roy Crankle is to thank for even giving him, after, after the first cover, he said, all right, Roy, you're, you're now my technical advisor. So Roy became the technical advisor. He became credited in the, in the paperbacks. And he was the one that came to my grandfather and said, I think, I think you should go with this story in the book and, and illustrate that. And then, of course, my grandpa would put the, the Frazetta effect and get the peak action and all of that greatness. But it was really, it was, it was Roy who we can thank for even selecting the, the perfect scenes. Very cool. So to the artists, Liam, when is the first time that you encountered Frazetta and Conan, and how hard did it hit you? And how have you recovered yet? You see, he's one of those artists that the first time you see him, it hits home, right? 
So I was a kid, I was at a school in uh, home in England, a place called Derby. And uh, we didn't have much money at that time, but there was a, a sort of old 60s concrete complex that had a, a news agent, and I would have been about. And uh, we used to regularly go to this news agent. And on the shelves one day was this one painting, and it just acts one little book, tiny little book amongst all the newspapers and all the magazines and everything. And I was just transfixed. Didn't ask my mom for it, we didn't have any money. I just couldn't stop looking at it. Uh, and every day I went in, it was there for about a week until, until suddenly it wasn't, and I felt terribly bereft and wished that I bought it. But it was, it was the first one that was coming here, you know, the classic adventure of one. And you know, it, it, it just is seared into my mind. I didn't know the nail artist's name. I had no idea. I didn't know Conan at that time, but wanted to very much. <laughs> uh, and and suddenly it was gone, and I was like, you know, it's a void then, it's a weird thing. But about three years later, um, I won a scholarship to a, 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 an art scholarship to a school down, a boarding school. I was like Harry, Harry Potter, really. It was this, Northern working class kid in the, amongst all the, the wealthy and great. Um, and, but the school had a, a bookshop, and in it they had a fantastic art of Frank Frazetta, and it had the princess, the, the Egyptian princess on the cover. And even though I had no idea that I'd been looking at Frank Frazetta before, as soon as I saw that, even at that age, it's like, that's that guy. That's the man. You know? like, Grabbed it, <laughs> so it makes sure no one's heard, no one else has heard of this. You know, this is mine. I'm taking it. <laughs> sort of phone home and said, I need five pounds or whatever. <laughs> I have to have this book. Can you, you know, save it for me? And that began. Yeah, yeah. and that was obviously that's the beginning for what is still the biggest collection of books and artwork of any other artist that I have in my in my studio. So how about you, Dan? What is your what is your Conan origin story? Oh, my dad or, or your Frizen origin story? Yeah, my father was an artist, and he was in this um, graphic album showcasing a lot of different artists in there. And there was a painting um, by Frizetta, and he loved it. And he was a real art critic, and uh, he he saw that one painting in that book, and so then he he found. Those Valentine books was it Betty Valentine? Were like the same ones you were talking about, and uh, I was about the same age. I was around eight years old or so, and it's a little racy. <laughs> 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 but uh, you know, give me feel me feelings. What was yeah. that? The other thing is like I'm feeling something. I don't know what it is. Yeah. But <laughs> I just blew up a little bit. Yeah, but it, you know, he didn't. He didn't mind. That that was approved, and. Uh, and then later there was this uh, record store, now record stores are coming back, but they had that big stand of Molly Hatchet um, for the Dark Kingdom um, poster, and I would, just like you, I would go specifically every day just to stare at that. <laughs> I actually bought one of them. I don't think there's too many of them left, but it's in my studio. And now my, my, I just fell in love, just like, that's why we're here. I, I was just obsessed with that look Particularly, the, you know, the Conan's. I mean, those are some of the most powerful images, but like the death dealer, and you know, I'm looking at this shirt right over here, this gentleman's wearing, like, you know, it's timeless. That thing's so cool. Everything he did is so cool, it's still relevant, and what's also amazing is so many, he influences so many artists today. It's, it's crazy. So my, I like, my, everything in this, my studio is for I have a few originals, and uh, I even have, um, Fire and Ice, he did. He actually sculpted um, the Marquettes, so I have those, and it's like, it's an obsession, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> so I'm very happy, I'm very, very happy to be here on this panel. It's kind of like, I, I wish my, my, my dad was still alive and would be gaming, you know? Very, very cool. So Fred, what is what is your personal journey with uh, with Conan, and what role does seeing these early presentas and everything play in in inspiring you to get where you are right now? Oh, that's a great question because I, I came a little late to the party. I'm a kid of the 60s, but I grew up in Sweden, so in Scandinavia we didn't have in those days any fantasy literature translated apart from Lord of the Rings. That was the only fantasy book. So 
as a teenager, uh, you could go, if you, if you went to the big city, you went to Stockholm, and I was maybe 15, like seven, seven or so, you would go up there, and you'd go to the stores that would import um, English literature, and they would import from the UK, from England, and the English covers were different. So there was no Lancer editions, no Ace editions, there were Sphere editions, and I think it was like Les Edwards maybe did some of those covers. So it took me a while, and I think my first uh, encounter with Frank's artwork was probably through the record albums, actually, because of course, yeah, when Molly Hatchet came and then you had all these, that was kind of like, whoa, this is cool. And then I had the fortune to come to the U.S. in 1979, 1980. I was 17. I was um, working for, I was kind of like an intern in the gaming, um, you know, Chiasium and all these uh, board game and tabletop uh, game companies. And then that was just like a shock. We, I, all of a sudden I was exposed to comic book stores and game stores. And uh, for me, at the time, there was sort of the two taste. Uh, taste of fantasy illustrations. You had the Boris on the one hand, right? And then you had Frank. And of course, like like what you're saying, it's the motion, it's the animation. It's something in that artwork which is just art more than fantasy. It's just captivates you uh, and draws you in. And I think when I returned to Sweden later that year in 1980, that was my my fantasy image of, not just Conan, I, I can't say that I was a big Conan fan, I'm probably like Frank, I probably, I wasn't the man that read all the stuff, I loved Lord of the Rings, I loved Elric, when I was a teenager, I read Elric, which was Morcock from, from, the, from the English, that's the, the literature we got, and then, you know, you move on, and, and uh, Star Wars, and the movies, and Aliens, all these great movies, um, but, I had the fortune to go into the creative industries early on, so I was young, I came back, and I got into uh, making games and making comic books and books, and the first book that I published was in 1984 in Swedish, so I translated the Robert E. Howard codes, and of course, we had to put, um, you know, work on there, uh, because to me it was always, he, he, it's art, it's, it's art. My grandma was an artist, and it's just like, you know, there's no comparison. It's the best, best fantasy uh, art out there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put up the eyes for that maddening look. I, I think actually, the reason is probably Frank channeled some inner ferocity, because this is not something you just whip out. This is something that comes from deep down. Maybe therapy for him. I don't know. Well, definitely, it was therapy for him. Yeah. He, I mean, he, he would say a lot of the times, like once once he first started with the paintings, especially the Conans, he was he was so excited to get started and just to conceptualize it and get the get the uh, all the com composition down. And then when he would start laying out the characters, he was like so excited. And then once he got to the details, which sometimes like like this one, there's not a ton of detail. That's just because it, it, it would bore him. And I and I heard actually Joe Jusco talk about his process yesterday and he said the details are therapy to him so it's so interesting to you know know like what's inside of people and how it can how you can kind of like psycho just from looking at their artwork so this association lasted over a over a fairly long period there were what seven or eight books in the series it's from 66 to 72. um this is actually this painting this this conan conan the warrior <laughs> is probably like the least recognized work of Conan that he did with the fans. Um, but that was actually, besides Conan the Adventurer, that was my grandfather's favorite Conan that he did. Um, and he, he talked about it all the time. Like he just thought that this composition was, this was more fine art to him. Cause he always said, why, why am I not considered a fine artist? What does that mean? He's like, you take it very literally. He's like, this is fine art. <laughs> so, so to him, this was like such a master. So yeah, he did. Um, he did four, I believe, in sixty. It was sixty-seven. 
This one was also 67. This was um, a lot of, again, guidance by Krangel. Um, you know what's interesting about that one is that here's kind of the back of the character. You don't even see his face, and it's still just so powerful. Who did that? No, like it's, it's so crazy. it's so ballsy to do. Just like I'm doing it my way. Yeah. I mean, really, really, truly incredible. Um, and then if you want to go to the next one, there he is with the usurper. You can just see how proud he was on his face. Like when you want to go back to that real quick, Rob. We just gotta like soak in Frazetta there for a moment because I mean, you, it looks like Clint Eastwood. There. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, but what's funny with this photo actually, because I had the fortune to work with Frank down, and uh, Ellie took me to the museum. And just like the Rembrandts are like super small, yeah. this is not a big painting. It's actually the real one on the wall. It, it looks big here. It looks like half his body, but it, they were really small. And of course, they were made for superbacks. Yeah. So why? Which I think adds to the genius of Frank because it's just like little brush strokes. It's just small little things that add to that motion and that animation. I think too, like with the start with. Um, because he was so used to just drawing in such a small scale. And he also, I, I really do think he had like a fetish for the small because I mean, his signature, <laughs> it was, <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> so yeah, most of his paintings were around like 16 by 20 inches. I mean, some of them like eight by 11. I mean, just really, really incredibly small and detail. When he, when he wanted to do the detail, it's kind of like when he did hands and feet, a lot of times he just didn't want to paint them because he was bored by it. But when he got there and did like a toenail, you're like, how the hell did you do that? He's finding some crazy yeah. reflective lighting and most something else. Yeah, it was, he was a vessel. Like, I mean, he, anytime he would try to explain his technique, he was like, I don't, I don't know how to teach anyone. I just do it. I just get, and I mean, a lot of the times, I mean, his process, right? Like everyone has their own process. He wouldn't just sit and draw and paint and he was out living. And then when he had a deadline or, he had someone criticize him, or he just felt inspired. He would go and knock them out in like two or three days. Some he did do overnight, kind of part of the exaggeration. I'd say most took about a week. Um, but yeah, he was just, he would just get all of that emotion and just put it onto the canvas. And I think, like I said, he, he had a lot on his on his shoulders with really proving himself at this time, and and Larry Shaw was like really like adamant about man we got to make this really big Frank. So when he was presented a challenge, he was like challenge accepted. We're gonna we're gonna blow the lid off of this. We did. So the question for the artist, I'll start with Dan. What is anything? Um, do you do you take personally from Frazetta's style, and what have you learned about the way that you approach this kind of subject matter from? What Frank did. Well, I, I think with Frazetta, and this is what kind of separates him from a lot of painters and artists, is that when you look at it, you see, like you said, a lot of detail, but in reality, um, it, it's, more, it's more about the emotion. Like the, the hair is just like, almost just like a brush stroke in some senses, but um, he, he knew uh, how to like focus the eye and to draw, you know, to paint rather, or, or when he was illustrating, where to bring that photo. I, that's something which I'm still, you know, we still have to think about and struggle with. But um, I, I just like this, there's a difference, like say, between Boris and Frazetta. Like um, with Boris, everything is the same um, veneer. Everything has the same amount of um, technical polish. But uh, with Frank's work, it, 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 it was different. Like it was, it was a little bit more raw. It just felt a little bit more now. For me, and that's why I try to incorporate it into my work. That's why I, I work pretty fast, so yeah, it's very helpful. Man. Yeah, I mean, it's the same. The problem with someone as great as Presenter is like the, the style is so idiosyncratic. It's like, well, there's asked ones to do a um, for, his, for his 80th that's a celebration of his 80th for Imagine FX magazine, and it was a, a tutorial. And it was a fantasy piece, but I was like, I can't, if I go, it was a death penalty. Mm -hmm. It might be up there somewhere. Um, but he, he, I, uh, I thought, I, I was about to go and get all my first books out, and I thought, I can't do that. If I do that, I'm just going to start looking <laughs> like Frank, because yeah. I'm just going to start channeling him, you know? And it's really hard if you, he's so iconic, you know, if you think of Conan, I think Frank. 
And it's like the way it's, like, every time I draw a cone, it starts looking like Frank, and then I have to kind of work backwards from that, kind of myself somewhere in there. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, of course, we have different interpretations of Conan these days. Yeah. But, like Barry Windsor Smith put a very non Frazetta spin on Conan. <laughs> like there are, there are, I you think have, have choices in terms of inspiration, and you, you, I think, draw from, from all the different wells of John Dee Oh, you know that. In my heart of you, in my crazy fantasy childhood, it's like, God, if you could just take Barry Smith, Basima, and Frazetta, you could create a perfect Conan <laughs> that would cover all the bases. But you, you can't do all of this. No, they, 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 both, they all fulfill a different. Yeah, they all have different almost uh, personalities to each one of those artists. You know, with, uh, common. Fred, do you have a particular image or favorite among these that, that really nails down for you, like that's going on? Well, I, I, you've got one of those pieces up there, Code to Conquer. I also have, uh, at my house, I have the uh, Claymore statue, the bronze of that one, which so you can sort of look at it in 3D and the force, the force of the Code of the Conqueror is as crazy as Conan is at that moment. It's like, you know, that furious energy of like, you know, we're in battle. And that's exactly what horse dressing or is all about. It's actually combat for horses, right? And it's extremely hard to sculpt a horse in 3D. That is difficult. And he, he nailed it on his, his painting, and I think Clay Moore uh, reproduced it excellently on the uh, statue. So I think this is one of my paintings, but they're all great. They're all terrible. I, I know, and I love, I love his focus. Frank is always like your eyes drawn to the center, and then he paints with all these, it's like a chiaroscuro effect with all the coloring and the lighting, and it's just like fantastic ghosts. It's the adventure that has all those skulls and things in the background. And just like, you can just look at it and it, it's inspiring. So I, it's hard to pick one favorite, but uh, I'd probably pick this one, The Conqueror. I actually have a story about this one. So I just I just learned this the other day. It's a uh, friend of Kirk Hammett and Metallica's. And he told me um, that Kirk, just, he, had, he had a couple for Zetas in his collection, but Kirk Hammett was such a fan of Frazetta's that before my grandfather passed away, and he knew he was getting up there in age, he went to my grandfather and he said, I want to buy Conan the Conqueror for a million dollars. And prior to that, and that, that year was 2009, prior to that, the highest painting that had sold was Escape on Venus for 280000 So if it weren't for Kirk Hammett, the paintings wouldn't be selling for like $6 million now. And, you know, my grandpa was a real frugal guy, grew up in the Great Depression, would not spend $7 on a Klondike bar, um, you know, like a few weeks before he passed away. I'm like, Grandpa, yeah, let's get the Klondike bar. But, um, so he didn't, he didn't know how to spend his money, but he knew, like, what great new records were. So for him, just the, the fact that a million dollars for a painting, it just, it gave him the confidence, the, the, the affirmation that he did what he came here to do. And then soon after that, like a month, two months before he passed away, he sold Conan the Destroyer for $1.5 million. So he just kept breaking records and he, you know, he talked about it a lot to my partner, Joe and I, and he was like, can you believe that? $1.5 million. I'm like, what are you going to do with all of it, Grandpa? And you just were like, oh. but it was just breaking that record. So this painting, her Hammett, I mean, I got, when, when I heard that, I was like, wow. Do you like, like Metallica, though? I'm sure you Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I, my grandpa, he was such a, a, a classic guy and so focused, which I find so interesting. He didn't really let new art in. Um, didn't he listen to, I don't know, like... Sinatra. Yeah. And Stravinsky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, he loved classical music. Yeah. I mean, he had, so even when you hear great music, like I would I bring music to him as kids, like, you know, my, my grandma loved PLO and... Go, it's not from like Sinatra. I'm like, yeah, but yeah. open your mind a little bit. But it was just, it was, it was like his focus even with like films, like King Kong. We watched it, the 1933 King Kong. We watched it hundreds of times together. So I don't even. He must have watched it thousands of times in his lifetime. I was born in '88, so 
I mean, Fantasia, Night of the Hunter, Robert Mitchum, I find myself watching it over and over again because I just, did you watch the tale? Oh no, yeah, my, it was the same way. They were, they were almost the same age. Okay, yeah. so yeah, they just kind of get real like super focused, but I think it's more like a superpower because then it just kind of keeps you in like your trajectory of like your energy, not like, we have so much information now where it's like, that's almost like a, it's, yeah, it's overload. So he, what he did was I think really special in the way that he could just Stay frank, grounded. What, what, I mean, more types like Danzig were like fawning over. All yeah. I was going to say one unfortunate aspect of your grandfather's frugality is sometimes he wouldn't spring for a new canvas. He would. Wow. Um, so the reason that you see sometimes see some variations between the printed version and the and the fine art version, for example, yes, yeah. it's not he wasn't doing another canvas. He was. No. He, and I, I really think it's because he was, um, I would ask him that question. I'm like, Grandpa, make painting. Because it's my art. Don't tell me what to do. I'm like, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just, I'm just asking a question. And he'd get very defensive about it. But, you know, he just, he wanted it the way he wanted it. So he didn't want the one to exist and, and have, have that go mulling in his head of, like, it's not right. So with this one, this was one of the, the only um, revised two Conan paintings, and this is one, uh, the Conan the Avenger. Um, you know, I, I think I really personally like the first version, but I, I mean, he, this second version is definitely more iconic. Like he, for most instances when he would do a repaint, it was for the better. There are a few exceptions to that rule. Sorry, Grandpa, I can hear him going. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> no, they're not. Was, was too bad for the collectors with a couple million bucks burning a hole in their pocket that there are three or four versions of this one out there in the market, I'm sure. But that's how it goes. Um, do we have any questions for our, for our panelists here? I saw a hand go up over there. Yeah, uh, Sarah, uh, you know, uh, talking about Frank's, you know, love of like small size images, do you think also maybe that was a function of him being able to knock it out faster because it was small? Definitely. Oh, yeah. He would have, he would have like, his head would have been spinning if someone gave him a giant canvas. Like, what am I going to do with this? I mean, he did do a couple personal works, like the Maasai Warriors um, that were larger scale. I think that was only at the request of my grandma um, when he was trying to like maybe pivot a little bit. But yeah, I think I think just it was. I, I think it mostly was because that's the scale he enjoyed. Yeah, well, I, I remember the uh, the Egyptian Queen was fairly large scale. Yeah, and that was one of the few he did on stretch canvas. Yeah, that was a 17 by 22 inches. Yeah. Yeah. So a little bit more. Other, other questions for the folks up here in the back, sir? Yeah, I have a question for Dan and Liam. Do you see uh, changes <coughs> from an art perspective? Mm -hmm. Just Sarah may have mentioned that he was sort of staying in a mode. Do you look at it as an artist and see he's progressing or changing or developing something across his versions? Um, Dan sort of said it earlier. You can see that he's a... He's, he's playing around all the time, you know, there's, a, there's bits that sometimes the paintings get very polished and finished and there's a, there is a kind of machine to it. Uh, I like the, the more kind of, you know, the, the rougher ones where it, it gets to the edge and you can tell it's really just the underpainting, but he didn't need it. I'm glad he got bored. <laughs> well, my biggest problem is I don't stop myself soon enough and I keep, you know, Liam's work is just laying and I've got to, I've got to learn what that is. <laughs> Not, not this one. But, um, yeah, one. yeah that, actually, that one, the back one. Isn't that the one that got stolen? Yeah, the back one. Yeah. With, the, yeah. I actually always loved that first one on the left. I know it's like it's so hunched up. And I think this, you can obviously tell me if I'm wrong here, but I think he thought he's just strangling somebody and there's not enough action in it. It actually was, I think, because he emulated with Tarzan and the castaways. Right. So I think he knew he was getting a little bit lazy there, and he was like, I need to change that. So, because he, he, had, he had a couple times where he would, um, I, I think it was a subconscious or just laziness, and he'd swipe himself again, <laughs> many years later. <laughs> you can't help but do that. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not like a moist so. again again. Like, Where did I see this before? Oh, yeah. I did it. <laughs> Open myself. Yeah. But I just love that kind of bulky, his neck all the straining of the first one in there, it's just so... I, I was going to skip ahead because we have a couple of examples of both Liam and um, Dan's work. So this is this is one, uh, these are a couple by Dan on the current uh, current title, maybe a promotional image that he did there. Uh, 
That was um, that was for a role playing game. Uh, it was black. That was huge, wasn't it? Really? It was, a it, was big it was big. Yeah. So it, it, it was a wraparound cover, which is why it's, it's sort of quite blank on the back. But uh, yeah, it was for uh, Black Colossus. <laughs> These are nobody's seen these yet. This is wow. you've seen this for the very first time. <laughs> This is from a 12 page of the Savage Sword that I've written, that I've written and I've done the first six pages of it. So, uh, oh. so this is a, a con exclusive right here. How, how long, Liam, have you been waiting to actually unleash on Conan? The how long have I been? So let's say I was six when I first saw that cover. I think that counts. So 50 years. <laughs> so Fred, as we, as we move this into the, the present, how important are these iconic representations of Conan from you know 40, 50 years ago to the current value and identity of the Conan brand? Great question because of course we're we're talking about classic big iconic artists like Mishima, Barry Witzer Smith, uh, very informative, very influential artists for Conan. But times change, artists come. But I and I do think that what Liam has there, I can see some Barry Witzer Smith, but uh, it's also very it's very Liam, right? So it. Artists are influenced as they grow up by their fans. Look at that, for instance. We've got, that's not so much. I wouldn't say that's Frazetta or Fushima or it, that's classic Pinocchio, right? Um, but I do think that for us now that we uh, control and heroic signatures, we do all the creative, and then we work with Titan as a co-publisher to do the marketing and the sales and the printing and, the, and all that. Um, we decided we have to go back to where the core of the character is, where our readers are, and they are very well, um, they're, they're kind of based in the 70s and 80s classic era of Conan publishing. So we said, let's not try to reinvent it because it's very classic, literature classic. It, it's very archetypical. So let's not stray too far away. Uh, and I think what we're seeing here, this obviously is modern art, but it is also very classic in its, in its rendering. And that's what we wanted. By the way, um, prior to this panel, like um, a couple of weeks ago, I had occasion to exchange some notes with Roy Thomas, and I mentioned that I was doing this panel. And of course, Roy is famously uh, the person who brought Conan to Marvel Comics. Um, and he talked, uh, talked Stan Lee into acquiring the license and, and everything. And I asked Roy, to what extent were was Marvel's approach to Conan, which came out in 1970, right in the right in the center cut heartland of when these presented covers were coming out? How much did that influence what Marvel wanted to do with the character? And um, he says, well, it didn't really have a lot to do with the with our approach to the stories, because he himself was a Robert E. Howard scholar, he had his own um, views on how he wanted it done. He didn't ask Barry Windsor Smith or later Busema to take a particular approach to it, whether for them or not. In fact, they ended up both taking very distinctive um, approaches to it. But one thing he did say is that, that he himself, his Conan fandom was born buying those first Conans off the rack. And he says, you know, I purchased the first Conan off the shelf primarily because of the gorgeous cover. Um, and um, that there was no way that anybody doing Conan in the in the 70s like that could avoid doing the, the work for, um, you know, being influenced in some degree by Conan. And he said, I said, did you ever try to get Frank to do the covers? And he, he said, he said that was that was a zero too far in terms of our budget. Yeah. <laughs> he said we could afford we could afford um, uh, Boris uh, for a couple, and then and then he was too expensive too. So, um, uh, but uh, but he said he would have loved to have done, it, but not uh, not economically feasible at the time. Do we have other questions for our uh, our panelists? Yes. I would like to selfishly tell you that the very first Comic Con I came to. 
The first piece of art I bought was the Death Dealer, signed oh. by Frank Frazetta, wow. which is an honor and beautiful piece of art in our home. But I wanted to ask you, how did Mr. Frazetta, when he would do the books, how much was he told about the storyline to decide what he would select for the cover or how he would present it? They're so beautiful as they are, and then to go with the story, I wondered how much did he, was he able to read some of it? Was he kind of told it and just went with his own thoughts? So with Edgar Rice Burroughs, yes, he was he was led again by Roy Crankle. I'm gonna keep going back to Crankle, same with Conan's. Um, and and he, and movie posters, I mean, it was, you know, the art directors are on you, and they're like, you have to get this character, you have to do this, and. Most of the roughs that he would give, they would deny and say, no, you're gonna do it, you're gonna do more of the style that we want. So because he loved his freedom so much, he really loved working for uh, Jim Warren and doing the creepy and eerie covers because he said, do whatever you want. Um, you don't have to, to follow the story. So, you know, we got some of his most iconic pieces with Egyptian Queen and Sea Witch, uh, Night Stalker. I mean, there's it, the list goes on and on, and that was just because he could just do whatever he felt, you know, he, he really loved working with the classics, the Dracula versus the Wolfman, because that's what he grew up on, so anything that he got to sprinkle, like his his inspiration and love, that's that's what he loved most. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, the Kong, yes, <laughs> that was his obsession. <laughs> mm-hmm. struggling for work at the time. It was after he left uh, Al Cap, and Al Cap was the head honcho of the industry at the time and said, you're not getting work, Frank, you're gonna leave me, good luck. So, and, and he meant it, he had a lot of power. So, you know, it was it was getting by with a little help of, from your friends and, and his friends were all looking out for him and, and he got him that job and Nick said, Let, let's do it. And I, I think like the, the consensus was it was beautiful and grotesque. <laughs> so people were like, what is this? <laughs> Ringo Starr, and it, left, it left, really left an impression. And it really speaks to the trajectory of his career, that when he started doing these Conan covers in 1966, he was doing some movie art, he was doing covers for eerie and creepy and stuff like that. When he stopped doing them in 74, um, he was doing almost exclusively really high-end commercial projects. The idea that, that, that Jim Warren could afford a Frank Rosetta cover in 1967 and Marvel Comics couldn't afford a Frank Rosetta cover in 1971 uh, tells you about how wh wh how his stock was rising. Well, Warren was actually paying him really badly. Um, yeah. They had, a, I don't know what other arrangements they had, but something was happening. <laughs> and um, But he did credit, really, like I said, working with Warren because of the freedom. So he would pass up, I mean, the movie, the movie posters, he made, I, I believe, on his first movie poster, it was like four thousand dollars, which was like huge at the time. That was his whole year salary. So, but because he didn't have the creative freedom, he was like, I don't really care about the money. But my grandma was like, You, you do. We're, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> I'm sorry, we had another question there in the middle, sir. Yeah, know exactly who got him that job but that was his only because I, I believe that was Marvel correct yeah, yeah the seven Romans yeah seven Romans yeah it was until 1979 yeah I'm not sure I, I'm sure they probably just offered him a, a good payday and that was one of the ones my grandma said you're gonna take that <laughs> <laughs> Sarah uh, Frank did, did the the seven Romans uh, just as a favor to Archie Goodwin the editor. there we go Steve thank you I didn't know that. Who was the editor in chief at Warren when he was doing right, the doing all, all all the best issues? Yeah, absolutely sure. Um, Sarah, do you have time to tell us the uh, the story behind that? <laughs> <laughs> there he is. There's the man of the hour. Uh, yeah, so Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, you know, he credited my my grandfather in part to why he wanted to play 
Conan and of course Robert E. Howard's story, he was so inspired. Um, he did say in a, a couple interviews, I believe it was at a uh, bodybuilding conference where he, he said he was actually a little intimidated. Um, so he really worked on his physique to get, you know, Frazetta ready. But um, we, we ended up um, getting in touch with him through his, his agent, I believe, and I said I, I'd love to send him, it's not the original, that's Candace. Um, so I said I'd love to send him a, a, a canvas print and he was like that was, that'd be wonderful and then he tech it was the cutest thing he, he sent this in an email a picture with like the writing on it and I'm like that's so cute <laughs> so so yeah it was this was like really awesome and then actually I was able to meet him um, he, he did a book with Tashin about his life and his career and he invited my mom and I and we went out there and shook his hand and he was saying jokes about Conan and he was just real you know real down to earth so so very cool moment. Very cool. So we're coming, we're coming to the no. end. I got very <laughs> jealous. I always have to say that. I'm like, no, we didn't give him the original. <laughs> um, so we're coming to the end of our time, but you guys have an announcement. I want to roll a video clip that you... Yes. So we are doing an exclusive preview of our official collaboration with Conan Properties to bring... Rolling. Drum roll. Speaking of Jim, so tomorrow at 11 we have a Conan panel about the comics and Savage Sword. Mm. There will be some special new news pieces that I'm not going to bring for, for them. Mm. At 11. Mm. Yeah, we're, what's, uh, what's, your, what's latest on your... I'm, I'm not so up here, I'm kind of free range, which has been nice. Um, <laughs> uh, I have got the... 12 page coming up, so I'm sorry, and next year we're also talking about a 48 page of written script for that. Um, but I keep thinking, I want to write the full script. I'm like, no, I'm right. more. I want You just want more. more. I just want to draw more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that would be a full 48 page, but I can wipe it with a painting cover as well. That's like the dream to have a full like magazine issue of the Savage Sword. Are you going to paint the cover? Oh god, I've got to paint that one. Yeah. <laughs> I might do it small. Oh, now you're yeah. right. <laughs> But folks, yeah, if you want to know my originals, they're like absolutely fucking huge. <laughs> <laughs> folks, if you have not seen or read again Starhenge books, which is his self published, or, uh, not a funny, but it's your own project, written, drawn, this is Liam Unleashed. This is Actually, the... it's very presenter inspired. There's copies on the image stand. That's the one that was off Renai's. eyes. Now they've got the whole trade paperback collection. It's slightly oversized. Uh, and it's like 192 pages, full, full color painted. It was digitally painted, so it's, but it's, it's, you'll spot the presenter in there. It's, it's no yeah. avoiding it. And one, one reason, by the way, that I was so happy to see both of you guys on the panel is that like Frank, 
throughout your throughout his career, you would look at his stuff and think, oh, he could just rest on his laurels. He could just do the same thing over and over again. And he kept evolving. And both of you guys, I follow you on social media, and I see your stuff. And it's like if all you did was yeah, uh, if all you did was the same stuff over and over again, that would be cool. But you don't you push it and everything. Finally, Sarah, last word. We're being kicked off here. Um, yep. What's what's new? On well, just stay tuned to all things for Zeta Girls on social media. We have a lot rolling out this fall, and this is where I am right now. And that's it. On the content. Right on. Thank you. Thank you.